University of Great Britain. Please welcome Joe for his presentation on VLF experiments on eight kilohertz. Take it away, Joe. Well, thank you very much. My DXCC totals are a little bit higher on 160, but I'm not going to brag with that now. I'm just going to talk about VLF instead. And I've always been interested in low frequencies, and I've, I spent a lot of time on, on, uh, on 160. But anyway, it's indeed an honor to, to be here today, and uh, it's a very humbling experience to, be rep to uh, speak on behalf of Radio Amateurs of Canada and to also be involved with some very dedicated experimenters on the, um, the low frequency groups on the, on the internet and the RSGB group. So today I'll be talking about VLF experimentation on the 36,000 meter band, which is quite a long wavelength. And um, so we'll, we'll get started right away. Um, the buys is an expression that's used in Newfoundland and Labrador to indicate the gentleman, whatever, although I use that term loosely when referring to myself, but I can very much assure you that uh, Charlie, who took over for me as, as the uh, section manager and DI who took over from Charlie are, are very much gentlemen and they're good CW men as well. So uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, I look back to my years as section manager with, with a great deal of satisfaction. It was a very rewarding experience and uh, it was indeed a great honor to, to serve Radio Amateurs of Canada. And um, I'm glad RAC got, got formed. I, I was a member of, of CARF. So I'm dating myself now, so I'll, uh, I'll just carry on with my, my talk. As was previously mentioned, um, I was inspired by the VLF when I, when I first drove by the great big huge mass at uh, GBR in Rugby, England. I think we're on a train trip between uh, Manchester and London. And so this shows on the, um, the antenna tuning coils at GBR. And this is the, the V2 insulator. And these massive insulators here holding, holding the, the, the downdrop into position. So this is, a, this is a massive station. They have hundreds of amps. I think uh, up to 750 amps of RF flows, up the, uh, flows out to this feed through insulator. And so what, uh, what, what can amateurs do? Um, this is the antenna system they use. This is a paper that was written uh, almost 100 years ago. And it shows the, the size of the of v, a VLF array. These towers are a quarter kilometer high, 250 meters are separated at 400 meters. And this is the, the three-story um, station that's uh, at the bottom of the towers. And it's interesting that, that the communications physics has, has been largely unchanged in, in the intervening 100 years. And um, some very smart people came up uh, and, and found a link between thermodynamics and, uh, and information transfer. And I remember a physics professor explaining to me how um, entropy and, and communications are, are um, are, are linked and I found this very, very fascinating and, and very, um, very profound. And uh, a, a very brilliant guy named Shannon came by in 1948 and came across this limit, which is, which limits the amount of information that you can transfer, the rate of information transfer in a given bandwidth. Now I'm, I'm probably misquoting that because I'm, I'm very ignorant about it, but it's a, it's the limit that, uh, that sort of specifies what can be done. And so, uh, what can be done by radio amateurs is limit, limited by the um, by the Shannon limit, and not by the amount of money or or how big their backyard is. So this is this is very, uh, I found this very powerful. So a brief outline of my talk, and I've got to watch the time here because we uh, I was I was um, got a bit of trouble getting going. So we'll talk about authorization, carrier generation, transmission reception, and discussion, and further work. And that's for want of a better uh, better outline. But anyway, there you have it. Um, to get on the air, you should be licensed. You should, uh, you, you do require a license. And uh, although the frequency at the time, the frequency is below nine kilohertz, not allocated anywhere in the world. Uh, this changed after WRC 2014. And I remember Brian Rawlings there and his, uh, I, got a, I got a little rack pin or a WRC pin from him. Thank you very much, <laughs> Brian. Um, <clears throat> after WRC 2014, the, the Canadian table of frequency allocations was republished. And in, these, in this table were two footnotes that, that allowed explicit uh, experimentation um, below, below, gave explicit authorization for experiments below 8.3 kilohertz. And before that, uh, I, had, I did some creative mathematics to satisfy the regional radio inspector, but unfortunately my transmitter would have to be type approved, which would mean more red tape. So I put it on hold until then, but I did get a license in, in 2014. And uh, th this, was, uh, this was a good first step. The next step is to, gen is to generate a carrier. Now this, there had already been some VLF work done in Europe and the indication was that you'd have to have a very, very stable carrier. So your VFO 
is certainly not good enough. Your crystal oscillator is not good enough. If you put your crystal oscillator in an oven to, to stabilize it, uh, that, that improves things a little bit, but not quite enough. If you put the whole kit and caboodle in another oven to stabilize it, you'll get a signal that's stable enough to cross the Atlantic and be detected. So I succeeded in doing that, um, or I should say the uh, Paul Nich Nicholson succeeded in detecting my signal, very weak signal in May of 2017. But this was inadequate for um, binary phase shift keen. And in order to do this, we had to have a GPS disciplined uh, oscillator. And so when you when you stabilize things with respect to GPS, it's um, it's, it's very, very stable. It's, it's approximately a stability of one second in a million years. And so that's, that's available to everybody for a very low price. We paid for one of these little um, oscillator modules here or this uh, GPS receiver. And you can program that to send any frequency. So you can multiply the frequency by 400 and then get uh, 2.5 microhertz Micro Henry steps, but uh, it's pointed out to me that if you lose your your synchronization, then you the, your 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 carrier loses its phase coherence. So I've uh, gone back down to an integral multiple of um, of hertz in recent times. And so uh, a few months after my first carrier detect, uh, the boys at um, Paul copied an Eve not if not message, a three character message in October of 2017, and this was uh, written up in the, um, the TCA article. So I've mentioned two um, bits of software here, the uh, Ebnot by Paul Nicholson, that's on albellion.org, and the Spectrum Laboratory, which is by Wolf, DL4YHF, just absolutely amazing software. These guys are incredible. Okay, getting back to some uh, quick and dirty stuff that I'm capable of doing, and uh, this is very crude and, and uh, almost shamefully crude. The, the, I'm, I'm switching here, reversing the phase of a hot carrier and I can hear, hear some of you in the background gasping. This is that's disgusting. You know, you're going to go all these sidebands and everything else. But anyway, um, this was, was for the first early experiments, and I didn't get any complaints of any interference. But what we have here is a monitor, a status lamp. So that lamp goes out. I run out to the shed and see what's gone wrong. And usually, if all my coils all burnt up, this indicates the um, the aerial current, and that changes if you get ice on your antenna. And um, you can also monitor the phase using an oscilloscope. And here we have a shunt resistor, and, and so on. So there's a reference to the article in TCA. And I've, I've, I've promised um, Alan another article, which I'm long overdue on. OK, well, this, this can be a little bit more elegant. You can use a, an XOR gate and, carry, and, uh, and phase shift the, um, the, the, uh, the carrier at a low signal level. So this is a little more elegant. So you can see some other bits and pieces here. A, a J28 for doing the CW. I will talk about that later. And some other miscellaneous things, um, an Arduino Nano for for doing keen and an Arduino uh, uh, you know, for doing frequency synthesis, and that's a frequency synthesizer. And this here is a GPS receiver for doing the phase coherent experiments. OK, so here we have a little bit of math. I was, uh, Dr. Jack Belrose wrote an article in a, in a, in a book, a chapter in a, um, in a book on VLF. And uh, he said that the, um, that the reactance of an antenna can be derived from the transmission theory in the case of a very short antenna. So, Essentially, uh, this is kind of neat. Um, I, I guess I don't have time to get into the nitty gritty of it and I'll probably get lost myself, but uh, the minus J tells you that this is the negative react capacitive reactance is capacitive reactance. Z O is your surge impedance, but surge impedance, which is a function of your height over your antenna diameter or cross section. The cotangent here gets very, very large when this term gets very, very small. Beta is 2 pi over lambda, and L is the length of the antenna or the effective height, which in my case is maybe 10 or 12 meters. Your wavelength is 36,000 meters, so this cotan term blows up, and what it means is that you've got very, very high reactance. And this is, this is a big challenge. There's no mention of your very, very low uh, radiation resistance as well, which we can get by modeling. This is a, an article I did for um, NISEC, which is the Memorials Engineering uh, conference. And uh, so it shows the, um, the effect of uh, top loading. So the rotated L. Frank Davis, VO1HP, has written a number of articles on the inverted L for 160 meter work. So for 3,600 meter work, the, the vertical portion is very, very small with respect to wavelength. And it's more, it's more like a rotated L rather than inverted L. So here we have um, for a 12 meter uh, vertical portion, we have um, up to 100 meters of top loading, and I've looked at the radiation resistance as a function of the um, of the top loading, and you can see that uh, even that, even that um, if you've gone from these these are micro ohms, so 80 micro ohms up to uh, 
up to 160 micro ohms. So you've doubled your radiation efficiency. That's going to give you three decibels. But the real change here is in the reactance. So your reactance is decreasing. And if, if you have a high reactance, you need a, a lot of inductance to tune it out. We need a lot of inductance to get a lot of loss. So the, the real, there's a real big payout here for using top loading. And so you can see by going from, from no top loading to 100 meters of top loading, you can um, get your reactance way, way down to, um, to 300 kilo ohms down to, uh, to 50 kilo ohms of, of inductive react of capacitive reactants. And um, even going up to 20 meters, you can, you can substantially reduce your, your reactants. So this is a, and how, how do you realize this in real life? Well, you have to make a, a, a very big coil. And so this took a bit of experimentation and lots of heartache because sometimes you'd make a coil and it would, uh, it would arc over and you'd, you'd have all this wire and it'd be very hard to find the arc. And uh, so this was, uh, this was a very painstaking and, uh, and often heartbreaking process. On low frequency, this is the coil I use for low frequency. That's in series. It looks like a dead short on VLF, of course, even though it's about two, uh, two um, millihenries of inductance. Here we have 500 millihenries or half a henry. The power is 30 watts. The antenna current that we can get is about 0.2 amps. The voltage is five kilovolts. And the effective radiated power is 10 microwatts. So your efficiency is 10 to the minus six. And this is all realized using about uh, a very long piece of copper wire, actually many strands of copper wire in parallel, about a kilometer of wire and draining two kilograms. And by comparing this with rugby, the GBR, they have 150 kilovolts and uh, they have 750 amps. So it's, uh, it's quite, it's a little pipsqueak antenna and, and they get maybe, um, is it 30, 30 kilowatts of ERP from, from or maybe more? I'm, I'm not sure, I can't remember. But anyway, it's quite a bit smaller. Dr. Belrose said that if you're not careful in VLF, you can catch your shed on fire if it's made out of plywood. And so I, I took precautions to do that and made sure the potentials were equalized, but I don't think there's gonna be a big problem when you get 200 milliamps versus several hundred amps. But anyway, that's a feed through and that's my answer to, uh, to the rugby station. And also, uh, this is a 26 foot uh, telephone pole. Um, there's 100 meters of, of wire that goes onto another pole, which is a bit higher. And, uh, and so uh, we have had trouble with woodpeckers. So QWP is a new, uh, a new Q signal that I've come up with. QWP followed by a question mark means, are you being troubled by woodpeckers? And until, the, uh, until I put up this plastic, that, that was a major problem with this pole here. They didn't seem to like the, uh, the steel tower very much though which is fortunate. Anyway, it works. And so this is a plot showing the relative field intensity versus, um, versus distance. There's a point called your near field, which is to the, um, to the left of this line. And past your near field, the, uh, the one over R term in the expression for your E field, the one over R term dominates. The others decay very rapidly. So you're not going to get any good propagation using this at any distance. And this means that you're getting radiation and lo and behold, the signals were picked up um, more than five kilometers away. In fact, they were picked up across the Atlantic Ocean by, by, uh, by Paul Nicholson. And it's absolutely amazing. And also using spectrum laboratory, people have also picked up the signals as well. Um, you can use a direct conversion receiver. You can use a, a VLF to HF converter. You can use sound cards and ADD conversion, software defined radio. And a lot of people can pick up um, SAQ, which is a, uh, an Alexanderson alternator in Sweden. This is on 17.2 kilohertz and it's a CW and they transmit occasionally. And it's always a lot of fun to pick that up. So I thought I'd mention that as well. Here's some of the reception hardware. This is a, um, an active antenna that you can build using a little piece of circuit board, a single transistor this is by PA0 RDT and SM7 LKN came up with a converter. He gave me some advice on how to convert this to 10 megahertz which was not too wise because you get a lot of interference on 10 megahertz from the, um, the uh, FT8 transmissions, especially around 137 kilohertz where I like to listen sometimes, but on VLF it's pretty good and pretty quiet. <coughs> on, so on Todd, Todd Morden, the signals are very weak, very weak. I'm sorry, this is a 0.3 should have been taken out and put over here. The signal levels are 0.3 femtoteslas or 10 nanovolts per meter, which is extraordinarily weak signal, but still corresponds to billions billions of, of photons if you look at it that way but very very weak signals and just but just strong enough to to be able to send intelligence it's amazing how that uh, how that turned out 
any weaker and I wouldn't, it wouldn't have been able, it wouldn't have been doable. Some of the American guys uh, did it, but they, they were using uh, much more advanced, much more power and much bigger coils than I was using. But I think they, uh, they put a lot more effort in it too. Here's some reception hardware. This is a VLF receiver. It's a direct conversion receiver. And that, um, so you have a, an XR 2206 uh, frequency generator, a quad bilateral switch for a, uh, a converter, frequency converter, a mixer, and an LM386 for an amplifier. So you can plug your headphones in somewhere. I can't remember now where you plug your headphones in, but you plug your active antenna in here and there's a bias T to feed that. And uh, you can pick it up, uh, you walk around, you can hear it about a kilometer away. And you can hear the CW about two miles away using your um, using the, the converter I mentioned earlier with a uh, an FT817 portable transceiver. And uh, I haven't been able to break the the two kilometer or the two mile uh, barrier yet, but uh, that'll that'll depend on changes to the antenna, I think. Okay, reception reports. That's uh, my signals have been received by people in six different countries, and um, this is a list of them here. It, it, it amazes me that they, they can do this and the amount of effort and time and, and, uh, and it's gone into the software development and setting up these receiving stations. It's, it's very good. The mode they're using was EBNOT PSK, binary phase shift keying. Um, so this is phase coherent, it's synchronized against UTC. So we all know what time the signal start, what time they end and, and that information has to be shared beforehand. And with, I've had one QSL, QSO on CW with my wife, Michelle. Um, the O1RL, she gave me a 5-5 report. No, I gave her a 5-5 report and she gave me a, a full quieting report and transmitting to me on CW from the, uh, from the station. And I was only a kilometer away uh, listening on her handheld. Joe, uh, it's Brent interrupting just one more time. Do you, are, are you on the presumption you're still sharing something because we don't see a share right now? Oh, it, when did the share go away? Uh, just maybe 30 seconds ago but uh just okay yeah uh, well I'm, I'm pretty much finished now so um i can try sharing again or we can well if, if you had a couple of more slides uh, to share if you wanted to maybe try to share one more time then we'd make sure we would get it all yeah, this if you don't mind up here. yeah we have we have time we're really good for time yeah okay um let's let's give that a shot then uh okay so i'll um I can work back to the starting point again. So I'm going to share screen, host disabled screen, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Oh, great. So I've lost my power again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well. Okay, so I'll, I'll just uh, go through the slides and you can you, use your imagination, I guess. So I, I can post, you can post them on, I can post them on, on a website or something, but anyway, I'll, I'll just carry on and you, you can use your imagination and I'll just try to describe the, the um, the slides. So basically, I talked about the the, the QSO the QSO we've had with with my wife and on the on VLF, and also so there's is a communication side of amateur radio that interests me, but there's also the physics side as well. And, and these slides are, are perhaps a little um, a little technical in nature, but they um, they show that uh, if you look at the uh, the um, the signals, the uh, and this is pointed out by DF6NM. The, the, the carrier sometimes get, it gets attenuated. So if you're looking for the signal on exactly the right frequency, you're not going to see it. And what happens is that the frequency gets shifted either side of the carrier by an amount that corresponds to the period, the frequency of the diurnal, the diurnal component of the, um, so that's when the sun rises and sets. So that, that, opposed, that shifts the frequency for that amount. And you do a Fourier transform on it. And sometimes you can see the carrier and other times you can't. So I found this quite interesting and we're trying, we're trying to explain that. And another thing I did was to uh, put artificial, artificial phase inversions on the signal. So if you invert the phase at uh, 400 second intervals, then you get sidebands offset from the, um, from the carrier. Uh, the total width between the two peaks is five, five millihertz. So again, this, this led me to think that perhaps there was some phase inversion going on when the, um, when the uh, because of the diurnal component or the diurnal changes in the ionosphere. But this turns out to be not the case, even though it's, it's mathematically it sort of fits, but uh, there are other things going on there as well. And I'm, I'm thinking about that. So if you're interested in this sort of stuff, by all means, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear from you. So further work, and this is just a list there now of, of what we're going to do. I'd like to try the big RL antenna. The small RL is 12 meters above ground. 
the big RL is much bigger. But I have to make a new coil for that. I'm afraid to touch the old one because it mightn't work again if I if I mess with it. Oscar Hurley, I once said, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So I'm very reluctant to uh, to mess with it. There's another thing I can do too is try a 500 meter ground loop antenna. Unless the antenna will just lie on the ground. You don't have to worry about icing, which is a which is a nasty problem in Newfoundland anyway. I'm always up in the woods trying to fix my antenna because it's it's, it's fall into the ground. If you leave it on the ground, it'll probably be all right if I can load it that way. Get a longer TA message, get my DXE total up from six. I'd like to monitor the phase and amplitude and post it to the website. That's of my transmission so people can people know what's going on. And finally, the, and these are important, I'd like to encourage Canadian amateurs to become involved in VLF. It's an absolutely fascinating aspect of the hobby. And I'd like to get REC support for a VLF band proposal. And, uh, and this work, uh, that concludes my talk. And this work certainly wouldn't have been possible without some, uh, some help from a lot of good people. I'd like to acknowledge Professor, Professor Eric Gill of the Faculty of Engineering at Memorial and Lenza Dell, who's the Department Head of Physics. Um, Frank Davis, VO1 Hotel Papa, who introduced me one time to uh, Dr. Jack Belrose, which was a, I was very honored to meet Jack. And he also introduced me to, uh, to Eric Gill after an ESAC conference. Marcus, DF6NM, Paul Nicholson, Ellen, G3NYK, my co-author of a QST article back in 2006. Jim, M0BMU, absolutely a brilliant guy and very effusive with his help. Stefan, DK7FC, who has done work on ultra low frequencies, absolutely amazing. And Wolf, DL4YHF, who's been very helpful too and has his uh, Spectrum Laboratory software. Russ, lots of other brilliant minds on the RSGB reflector and the VLF group. And local amateurs, of course, the AWRL, RAC, Alan Griffin, who's been, uh, who's, who's did a lot of work with me when I was, was section manager and uh, also as some of the articles I've published. And of course, Trish and my family who've been very patient with me and helped me pursue my, uh, my passion. And thank you very much for your attention. That, that's it for me. And I hope you got, hopefully you got the last part of my talk without that being cut off as well somehow. Thank you very much. That's awesome, Joe. The audio was fine all the way through. So well, thank perhaps... you very much. Enjoy your life. Yeah, perhaps if you want to send uh, your slide presentation to Trish, maybe she can find a way to repackage it with your spoken audio and then recover it and kind of reassemble it into what we would have seen here. So that's wonderful. And I see Frank is actually with us. Uh, VO1HP has, uh, is in our group today. And earlier on, just before uh, we actually began, I know that Robert, uh, he had a question that he began to pose and I told him I wasn't the guy to answer the question, but he would be along shortly. And that's going to be you, Joe. So Robert, do you still have that question? And please unmute yourselves if you have a question, by the way. Everyone is automatically muted. OK, uh, thanks, Brent. Uh, I was curious about uh, Argo, uh, that uh, the software. And I also have a, um, a G, uh, GPS or satellite uh, disciplined oscillator here and uh, uh, I'm kind of working with another fella uh, to try and get into VLF work and that any comments you might have Joe? Oh boy it's uh, <laughs> it depends where you want to start a lot of people start try trying to receive these signals and uh, I'm, I'm not very good at receiving I'm, be I'm better at transmitting than I am at uh, at receiving and I guess receiving you have to have a sound card or you have to have um, you have to have a specialized receiver or, or specialized specialized hardware such as A to D conversion so um, I started out small I started out transmitting over a distance of about one millimeter and, <laughs> and built it up from there so if you can start with an oscillator and and just picking up your signal at, at short distances and, 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 and developing receiving equipment and may, maybe making a, a simple um, direct conversion receiver. Or you can perhaps buy commercial software to find receivers that go down that low, I'm not sure. But um, just just try, trying to transmit into bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger antennas, but you need a lot of inductance to, to transmit. And unless you have a lot of space to stick up an antenna, you're gonna need a lot of, a lot of inductance, but don't be discouraged by that. You can. You can have very low radiation efficiencies, and if you get a, if you get out of your backyard, sometimes that's um, that that's viewed as a as, as a major accomplishment. So, getting across the Atlantic was was totally unexpected for me. I, I was just 
And I was just flabbergasted when somebody told me they, they, they picked up my signals and I was so delighted they picked them up after after five kilometers. So start out small, keep your expectations modest and, and the payback will be will be incredible. Because don't forget you're dealing here with, with extremely low efficiencies. And uh, if you can pick anything up at all, it's, it's a major achievement. That's and, great. You know, if you can radiate anything. Awesome. Any follow up, Robert, on that? Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, just wanted to say, it, 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 do you are you involved with the Yahoo groups? Uh, involved with VLF? I check into that one occasionally. I haven't haven't registered for it, but I'm a member of the RSG VLF group, and then sometimes they they have some postings on um, on uh, on VLF as well. But uh, yes, I am involved with that, and I read these things with great interest and uh, and much admiration. Some of these guys are absolutely brilliant. So. <laughs> <clears throat> And very helpful too. Thank you, Joe. Thank You're you, welcome. Robert. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Uh, if you do, uh, I, it's a small enough group, I think, that we can just allow you to unmute yourselves and just uh, fire away. Yeah, not necessarily technical. I noted uh, you had a solution for woodpeckers. We're losing a tree which is holding up our messenger line to one of the towers. You know, we'd love to get those critters away from it. <laughs> yeah, it's they're quite pesky, you know. I got I, I don't have I don't have climbing uh, uh, spikes on on that tower, so I got to put the ladder up, and uh, it's it's it's, it's I'm, I'm not getting any younger. And it's <laughs> and I'll cover up the hole with a piece of plastic, and then that'll uh, that, that'll usually get the woodpecker frustrated, and he, he won't come back. And uh, so, <laughs> but I, I thought about putting a uh, couple in the antenna to the. Um, to where the woodpecker was going, and uh, he'd, he'd probably get a nasty jolt if he tried to to work on the pole again. But <laughs> I, I, I'm kind to him. I, I just cover up the hole, and he, he gets frustrated and leaves. And normally that's what happens. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, these guys have built themselves a high high rise condo. There's so many holes in it. I think we're going to just have to abandon the tree. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I'm grateful they're not going after my steel tower. That would be a bad one. Uh, Francois, uh, Daniel, you had your hand up. Uh, Avivou and Castillo? Uh, that's correct. Uh, a question for Joe. In, in January, you, you, you had a message copied in Germany. And I was wondering, uh, how long is that transmission? Is, is, is data accumulated over several hours, several days? Uh, I read about stacking. So can, can you tell me more about that? Well, that's uh, that's where that's where the cheating side of it comes in. I guess it's not really cheating, but uh, it wasn't the message that was sent in a single go. It was sent, uh, I think, 18 times, and it was optimized so that to get the best signal to noise, period. When when the signal was being sent, so the signal the signal would start at mutual night time for both of us, both the transmit and receive station. So you'd occupy that for your transmission, then you'd stack it over 18 days, and so I, I should. Um, get together and publish a, an article to, to explain these details in a little more clearly. But basically, no, it, it wasn't a one-off transmission. It took 18, 18 times to, uh, to do it. I mean, by stacking, you can get the signal to noise ratio down and then eventually you reach a certain, a certain threshold where the signal exceeds the noise by the amount dictated by the, um, the Shannon limit and then the signal, the signal can be copied. So it's- Thank a, you. It's Thank a you. Of process. Thank you, merci Francois. Any other question? Is it question for Joe today? I don't. Joe, uh, Robert here. Yes, Robert. I uh, just wanted to show you that this is the uh, GPS dis discipline oscillator I I have here now. I'm oh yes. Yeah. Look at the one I had. It's got the little connectors on it and the, the antenna. The uh, just a regular GPS antenna. Oh yes. There, and uh, I I'm going to try and listen on my uh, seventy six hundred. Um, oh, <laughs> radio the ICOM seventy six. I'm going to try and use that. Um, but uh, oh, what was it? Oh, uh, this came from Leo Bodnar in Britain. And uh, I just thought maybe, uh, I don't know whether you've used any of his equipment or not. 
Well, I haven't used this equipment, but I've used the um, the GPS modules that, that you were that you were showing me there, and I'm familiar with these. But I, I don't think I think it's a bit premature for you to start using the GPS modules. You could probably get a, a good good enough carrier using a, a five fifty five timer chip to <laughs> for, for the local stuff anyway. <laughs> it sounds amazing that you can generate RF with one of these little little um, uh, cheap little ICs. But to, just to start off, you you can do that. But if you want to get further away, if you want to get out to maybe, maybe a thousand kilometers, then then you'd probably have to start using the GPS systems oscillators and um, but I don't think you're going to have a, a, a. You might get some advantage uh, having having your carrier that stable, but uh, for, for for just out to a kilometer or so, you've got to start there first. Uh, you'd probably just be okay just using a um, a regular carrier generator, such as a, a crystal oscillator or something. Um, but if you want to get started on on making a, a a good stable carrier, well, you know you can you can try that. I, I, you can do it, but. One of my Elmers told me to li listen first before you transmit. <laughs> so, That's a good way to start, but, and you could probably start you you start uh, with um, with SAQ. They transmit on seventeen kilohertz, and if you can receive them, then uh, then you could probably receive your own signals if you, if you tried. And, but uh, it's it's a job to say. It's been so it's such a long time since I started uh, experimenting on on VLF, and I've made a bit of progress mm -hmm. since then. It's but. Um, it's hard to say how I'd start off. I, th I think I started using, I got out some of my backyard for the first time. I was using a, um, a crystal oscillator and, a, uh, and, and uh, an active antenna and used a, uh, a computer, a laptop computer with, with its own battery pack. And I used a, um, an active antenna, plugged it in. I was running a spectrum laboratory. And uh, you can actually pick up, you can actually configure that so, it's, so it, uh, it sends back the Morse code. So I could hear, my call sign <laughs> outside my backyard, and that, that was a big thing for me. But my antenna was 100 meters long. But as you can see from these these pictures here, you can get your um, you, you can even with a smaller amount of top loading, you can still get your antenna efficiency improved quite a bit by 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 top loading. So that's what I'd, I'd encourage working get, getting the biggest, much wire as you can in the air, as high as you can get it, and that's the, that's the general rule for for working on the long waves. Yes, I don't. I don't think I, I've got power lines behind me. And uh, the fellow that I I talked with, uh, Bill V E two I Q, uh, Bill DeCarl. I don't know whether you know him or not, um, but he has received those signals from Germany uh, as well. And uh, I know. He's involved with frequency measuring test. And that's what I'm getting mixed up with is the frequency measuring tests uh, in uh, in this in the states there. Yes, I know I know Bill very not not very well. I wouldn't say, but I, I know he tried to cut from my signals one time, but I'm not sure if he was successful. And it seems my antenna has a has a bit of a front to back ratio that it favors Europe and and and, and sort of is attenuated as you go to the uh, as you go to the west, but. Um, I know Bill did try to copy my my signals, and I know Bill is a very, very knowledgeable and, and smart guy when it comes to to weak signal work, and I've, I've admired much of his work. And uh, I remember when I tried to get on 180 kilohertz, uh, I think I think Bill was sort of helpful in that regard, and and he may have played a role in, in getting uh, getting a, an experimenter's band down there like they had in the states. So do give Bill my my very best regards, and, uh, and tell him I, I do remember the. My, my correspondence with him and uh, my, he has my much much of my admiration. Thanks, uh, Joe. All right, very good, folks. Um, if there are no further questions, Joe, uh, certainly on behalf of uh, of the organization and uh, and those who put it all together today, I want to thank you. It was a very interesting presentation, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, yeah we got applause coming up there from Francois and a few others. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a way to, you know, repack this. And uh, so when it's up on YouTube, it'll have a little more of the visual part. I think we lost you around slide 16 or 17. So I know you had 21 all together. So we don't think we missed much. Yeah, I'll take care of that, Patricia. And I'd like want to thank everybody very much and say it's, it's been a real honor to be invited to, a, to give this talk and to talk to RAC it's, uh, and section manager as well. It's, it's, it's really been a great pleasure. And I congratulate you on this, this great organization and I encourage everybody to support it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. I'm